Hello, everyone. Welcome to this very interesting session that we'll be having on Iran and an outstanding book written by our guest. Uh, and before we begin, I want to uh, remind you for, for newcomers that you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, once we have uh, finished the main presentation. So I wanna encourage you to become involved with us uh, in this one hour session. Today, we're uh, really pleased to be joined by Puya Alimagam, who is a uh, renowned <laughs> teacher uh, here at MIT, and I say renowned because he won one of the most prestigious teaching awards, the Leviton Prize uh, for teaching. Uh, he's been here five years, and he has produced a, a really remarkable book uh, called Contesting the Iranian Revolution, The Green Uprisings, uh, which is not only exceptionally informative, uh, but also well-written. Uh, not not the not the easiest combination, and uh, Puya will be speaking for about thirty minutes, and then we will open it up to questions. So, without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, Puya Alimagam. Okay, um, hello, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's very wonderful to be speaking at my home institution, even though um, I am not actually on campus. I am in California. But before we begin, um, I really wanted to first say um, thank you for uh, thank you to the Center for International Studies, um, in particular John Tierman, uh, Michelle English, and Laura Kerwin. Um, in particular, particular, I would like to thank uh, Michelle because we've been planning this for a while and we had hoped to um, organize this book talk last spring, but um, as with pretty much everyone else, COVID kind of either ruined a lot of plans or delayed them. But here we are on the 42nd anniversary of the Iranian revolution. Um, and I'm very happy to be here to share a book that is um, on the uprising in 2009, but is very much intertwined with the history of the Iranian revolution. So if I may, I'm just gonna share uh, my slides with you real quick. Um, I just always use slides, I love having slides. And um, here we go. Uh, before we begin again, I wanted to take this time really quickly to um, pay tribute to my grandfather. Uh, he passed away um, a few months ago, and he is part of the origin story um, behind this book. Uh, my grandfather um, and my father, who, um, whom we could see at the right, standing next to my grandfather, along with my mother, um, and my grandmother to the bottom left, all four of these people have been very much a part of my um, ability to foster a connection towards uh, Iran and my Iranian heritage. Uh, I am somebody who was born in Iran, but I was raised in the United States. Um, but really through them, uh, in particular, my grandfather was I able to um, develop this tie with Iran. And this book is very much a product of that connection. <clears throat> All right, so along with the family background, the book has um, an origin story. Uh, one of the reasons why I was excited about writing this book and passionate about it was because um, really uh, the Iranians themselves who were on the ground in 2009 um, captivated my um, interest, really. Uh, when I saw the footage of the campaigners campaigning before the June 12th, 2009 vote, it struck me as a very interesting campaign. It really was much more than a campaign. It was a street movement. Um, I remember my father and I were watching the footage and my, my father really was, um, believed that this was really more than a campaign, that this was some sort of revolution underway against the Iranian government. 
Um, and so from, from its very inception, I knew that this, this history that was about to unfold was very um, different and interesting. Uh, when it did begin to unfold uh, post-election, uh, the turmoil in the post-election period, um, I remember reading a lot about people talking about how this, this movement, this movement turned, this campaign turned movement, turned uprising was really still within, was still operating within the confines of, of some sort of reform movement within Iran. Um, they basically said this was a power struggle uh, between the different factions within the Iranian government. I disagreed, I disagreed wholeheartedly. I thought this was a, an uprising, a bona fide uprising that was in itself a revolution. Uh, it wasn't really a reform, an outburst of reformist energy, not at all. Not only was it a revolution in its own way, but it was very much tied to the revolution of revolutions in modern Iranian history, the Iranian revolution of 1978-79. So we were all kind of in a way captive to that history. I remember a lot of the journalists who were talking about this uprising in 2009 kept invoking the Iranian revolution. This was the largest protest movement since the Iranian revolution. That's really how they phrased it. Um, but really what was interesting to me was to see these demonstrators themselves harness the history of the revolution to then come out against the outcome of that revolution, the Iranian government, the Islamic Republic. So that for me was really fascinating. And I wanted to kind of push back about, uh, push back against that rhetoric that this was a reformist movement. When the dust had settled, by February 2010 and onwards, um, there was a lot of talk that this was a failed revolution and that the uprising was over. Um, I disagreed with that entirely. I thought that um, sure, the revolution failed or the green uprisings failed to um, abrogate the election results of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad um, for whom they thought uh, he had won, alleged, uh, had, had won through fraudulent means. And then at the same time, they failed to overthrow the system that ratified his so-called election win. But I didn't think of it really in those terms. I thought that um, sure, while those, those were failures in the uprising, it had many enormous successes. Um, too much to kind of list here, but um, really I go through it in the book. Um, also, I didn't agree with the talk about the uprising being over. Um, you know, when Khomeini was exiled in 1960, after the 1963 uprising, uh, it wasn't over then either. And he came back in 1979 at the helm of a revolutionary uprising. Um, and I think that the uprising in 2009, while there's no more talk of obviously undoing Ahmed Najjar's election when everyone's kind of moved on from that, but the legacy of that uprising and its successes have pollinated um, future protests, uh, protests and uprisings that have happened since 2009. Um, so I actually don't think it's over at all. And I don't think it was a failure. And I really wanted to push back against those two narratives. <clears throat> I'd like to discuss with you the hopes and aims of the book. Um, one thing for certain is that I really wanted to um, center the Iranian people, those Iranians who made this uprising. Oftentimes when we talk about history, um, we center the government or the state or great men of power. Um, I really did a history uh, that was very different. I wanted to center the men and especially the women uh, who were on the ground, who were sent the central agents of this history. And that's also why I chose this book cover. This book cover is not about Mir Hussein Musavi, the opposition candidate who alleged fraud. It's really about the person behind that poster. Um, I, I specifically chose it because it was a woman, because uh, women were so uh, important to this uprising. But there's just so much to this image that resonated with this history. Um, and that's why I thought it was an organic fit with the book, not only because she's a woman, but because she's covering her face, right? She's essentially concealing her identity because she's worried about um, political repercussions of having uh, backed Mir Hussein Musavi or potentially being involved in this uprising afterwards. She's wearing green. Green is the color of the uprising. It was the first time 
uh, in modern Iranian um, history that a color was adopted by a movement or a campaign. Um, this is also one of the allegations that the Iranian government le leveled against the movement that it was part of this you know, conspiracy of color revolutions or velvet revolutions. Um, you know, I push, you know, I, I unpack that in the book as well. But, um, you know, green is also the color of Islam. And Mir Hussein Musavi is a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. He's a Sayyid. And so the campaign adopted green. And here she is wearing that campaign color. Um, she's holding a peace sign, or it could be a victory sign. Um, I don't really know. I've talked to activists. Some have said this is a peace sign. Some have said it's a victory sign. Some, some have said that they're not mutually exclusive and they could mean both. And so I think that, that this very much applies to the movement. It was largely um, a peaceful uprising and they felt that their candidate uh, was victorious. And when their can candidate was snubbed, they were insistent that they were going to be victorious. And in many ways, as the outline in the book, um, they have been. Um, I also like the fact that she is wearing the chador, the, the full body veil, um, really because it pushes against that dichotomy. There's this common belief, especially in the West, that if someone is religious, then they support the Iranian government. And if someone is critical of the Iranian government, then they must be a an atheist or a secularist. And so I don't think that's a very useful uh, dichotomy. And you know, there's a lot of in between, um, and here she is, um, you know, outwardly at least showing signs of piety, but also um, visibly in support of the opposition candidate. Uh, another hope and aim of this book is to really extrapolate the revolutionary discourse. The Iranian government came to power through a revolution, and then it, it institutionalized a lot of revolutionary symbolism and discourse to self-legitimate. Um, in particular, those symbols as they relate to Shiite Islam. I wanted to show um, how that the state does not have a monopoly over those symbols and how despite the fact that Islam can be used to legitimize, to legitimize or legitimate a state, it can also be used um, as a discourse of resistance and revolution against that very state. Um, so that's essentially chapter five. Um, I wanted to situate this uprising in 2009 as part of Iran's long genealogy of protest from the tobacco revolt of, 18, of the 1890s um, all the way to even past the uprising in 2009, um, such as the protests in 2000, late 2017 and early 2018. Um, there's a lot of connectivity to this history and I want to situate the uprising within that genealogy. Uh, in chapter four, I really wanted to show uh, why Iranians are more Catholic than the Pope when it comes to Palestine. There's always this question, uh, especially in the West, um, about why do Iranians care so much about Palestinians? They um, care more about Palestin Arab Palestinians than other Arabs, than other Arab states at least. And so um, what I really want to do was explain why Palestine was so important to an entire generation that made the Iranian revolution, but also how the post-revolutionary government institutionalized the symbols of Palestinian liberation, drilled an entire generation um, raised under its authority, and how that generation 30 years later in 2009 used that symbolism of Palestinian liberation uh, against the Iranian government that championed Palestinian liberation itself. So it's very fascinating how they did it. Um, it's their story, and I wanted to put it down. Um, the last hope and, and aim of the book is really to kind of provide a reader um, a, a, a you know, general history of modern Iran, but with, with an obvious emphasis of the past 40 years from 1979 um, to the present. All right, so, you know, when I, if I had, you know, more time uh, in this book talk, I would have actually played for you the preface to the book. Um, I have an audio clip of the preface that I recorded and I posted it on Twitter and I share it when I can, really because I wanted to um, emphasize in the preface what my, um, 
you know, what some of my political aims are for the book. Um, these are pictures from Behesh Zahra, Qat Shahada, the martyr section of um, this massive cemetery, Behesh Zahra in Tehran, where a lot of um, Iranians from the revolution and the war, fallen Iranians from the revolution and war are buried. It's one of the largest cemeteries in the war. It's a very solemn place, obviously. Um, I had um, really the good fortune of visiting it in 2006. Um, and I was there with my father, my father and my um, cousin, and we went and spoke with, we were there on a Thursday. We didn't realize that a lot of families gather by the graves of their departed. Um, on the eve of Friday. And so there was a lot of people there and that, that took us by surprise and we spoke to many of them. And um, one thing that, and that's the picture of me at, at the cemetery. Um, and one thing that one of them told me kind of stayed with me. Um, one of the mothers of um, her son that had passed away during the war, she told me something that stayed with me and very much informed um, this book and, and the kind of sense of duty I had to tell this story and to tell it right. Um, she basically said, I hope my son didn't die in vain and this generation fixes Iran's problems. This is something that it was, uh, you know, that weighed heavily on me throughout um, the writing, the long duration of writing this book and really a lot of what I do in my scholarship. But what I really wanted to do with the book is show that how this generation uh, in 2009, but also onwards, really is up to the challenge. And that uh, essentially I hope that a lot of us who live abroad, especially foreign governments, stay out of, stay out of their way and let them um, do what they know is best for the country. Uh, I'm gonna revisit this point on my last slide. All right, the book's central argument. I argued that the Green Uprising is a manifestation of how large segments of Iranian society, including revolutionary leaders and clerics, are moving beyond the rigidity of the Islamist ideology in favor of a more pluralistic system. That is not to say that this was a movement of atheists or irreligion, but one that stressed civic rights over religious duties. To save religion from the state that operates under the rubric of a narrow religious interpretation. Um, the book also situates the history of the Green Uprising within Iran's long history of contentious politics, as well as the revolutionary history of the region. Because the uprising predates the Arab uprisings, the book also considers its connectivity to 2011 and how the Arab Spring in turn impacted the Green Movement when opposition leaders tried to harness its momentum to rekindle their revolt. There is this understanding that the opposition candidates have been in uh, under house arrest since 2009 when the uprising began. No, they've been under house arrest since 2011 when the Arab Spring uprisings began. Because when the, when the Iranian government thought that this, upri this green uprising had been over, had been dealt its death knell in 2010, all of a sudden, um, Musavi, Rahnavard, and Karubi, um, the opposition candidates, in 2011, in February 2011, tried to harness the momentum of the Arab Spring, especially when Hosni Mubarak in Egypt fell, to then rekindle their own their own revolt within Iran, um, and that's when essentially they've been under house arrest since 2011. Methodology. Um, so, the Iranian Revolution not only informs this book, but it also informed the protest tactics of those who were participants in the uprising in 2009. But to stay true to that history, the literature of the Iranian revolution also helped provide the framework and methodology through which I um, engaged with this history in 2009. So like I said, I, I tried to center the people who were the, uh, who were the um, activists on the ground who made this history as opposed to the leadership or the government or states or anybody else. Um, but really the means by which I did this was through the British Marxist tradition um, as you know, conveyed to me through Yervanda Abrahamian um, through, this history from a, through this history from below or bottom up approach. 
The history is being told from the bottom, from the people on the ground. But also, there's, like I said, there's a lot of literature from the revolution, from the Iranian revolution of 79 that informed the study. Um, Mansur Muadel's class politics and ideology in the Iranian revolution, especially as ideology as revolutionary discourse was very informative for me and, and how I understood this uprising. Um, the Unthinkable Revolution in Iran, Charles Kurzman's book, I think it came out in 2003 or four. Also, you know, his whole theory of, you know, the importance of opportunity in uprisings and his work on anti-explanation. And I go through this in more detail in the book, very important. Um, Misak Parsa's very important book on the Iranian revolution. The Social Origins of the Iranian Revolution, um, his work on resource mobilization and solidarity structures, um, very important um, to what I did. Um, and the last book, uh, probably the most important one, is um, Asaf Bayat's Making Islam Democratic um, and his work on post-Islamism. The really interesting thing is I'm a historian, but all four of these books are works of sociology. So um, I ended up using a lot of um, methodology from sociology. Uh, not that sociology is a better way to engage this history. Um, I, you know, historians and sociologists and anthrop anthropologists and political scientists like to argue about their own methodologies, but I, I don't think there's any problem in borrowing from one another. And um, that's very much what I did. All right, so real quick, um, I know we're pressed for time, um, but I only have a two or three more slides left. Uh, just an overview of the election. Um, the election happened in 2009. That's the primary focus of the study, but obviously we have to engage in history. In 2005, after eight years of a Khatami reformist administration, there was uh, the, the, his reformist um, policies kind of hit a stalemate um, and there was calls by the youth to boycott the elections in 2005. They felt that there was no point in voting. Voting legitimated the system and that real change can't come through the ballot box as evidenced by the um, eight years of Khatami at the helm. And so there was a boycott. And you know, I think typically with Iran or in other countries like the United States, uh, when a lot of youth don't vote, um, oftentimes a conservative wins the election. And that's essentially what happened in 2005. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, a former revolutionary guardsman, uh, came to power, uh, partially because of that boycott. And then after four years with him at the helm, uh, a lot of the youth understood that while the elections in Iran are very much vetted and screened and controlled, the outcome still made a difference in their lives, especially when someone like Ahmadinejad appointed a lot of revolutionary guards commanders um, to be part of his cabinet. And these are people who didn't have um, a lot of experience in civil administration. Uh, they were guardsmen and that helped with the secure, securitization, the militarization of the state. And so uh, when there was renewed calls for a boycott in 2009, it, fe it fell on deaf ears. A lot of Iranians understood that, like I said, the elections may be highly controlled in Iran, they still have a material impact in their lives. And so a lot of youth, a lot of women grew interested in the election. Part of their interest was sparked because of the televised presidential debates. Uh, Iran uh, has had, has long had televised presidential debates, but this was the first time they were one-on-one. -on -one. And because they were one-on-one, -on -one, they were much more adversarial. And in one very um, massive showdown between the incumbent, Ahmadinejad, and the challenger, the main challenger, uh, Musavi, it turned into this very ugly discussion. And a lot of things were said about corruption and, and other things. And, people were stunned that these conversations were being had on national television. And they understood that this was gonna be a different uh, election. And so a lot of people came, became interested uh, in the elections. The other thing is the Iranian government wanted them to be interested. Uh, like every government, um, this is a state sanctioned election. And by participating in it, you're participating in that state sanctioned process. And so you're essentially acknowledging or indirectly affirming the legitimacy of, of the state. So, and this is why there's always these calls for boycotts, especially from you know, people abroad. But 
the Iranian government wanted people to participate in the elections because by voting in the elections, you're participating in a state sanctioned event. So a lot of the typical repression in the country was relaxed. A lot of the uh, internet restrictions, a lot of the social media restrictions were relaxed so that people could go on YouTube and Twitter, uh, well, more, more on Facebook actually, and talk about the elections and the candidates and debate and discuss and get excited and then go and vote. But you know, it had um, unintended consequences because the electorates sensed that something was different now. There was a, a, op a political opening in the air. And this um, prompted many to take advantage of this opportunity to not only campaign for their candidates, but then to air highly anti-government slogans. So one of the slogans that was aired before the elections, before any allegations of fraud was Mag bar Taliban, che dar Kabul, che dar Tehran. Uh, death to the Taliban, whether in Kabul or, or in Tehran. Essentially saying death to the clergy, um, you know, wherever they are, but in particular in Tehran. So these are things that you saw kind of happening before. And then it, it morphed into a total street movement. And this is when the IRGC commanders um, became very nervous. They essentially accused Musavi before the elections of launching a velvet revolution and promised to nip it in the bud. Uh, brief timeline, the elections happened June 12th, uh, 2009. The, uh, the results were announced that night. The next day, I think um, a lot of emotions got the better of people. And um, there was some rioting that happened uh, because they didn't agree with those election results that had uh, alleged fraud. They were. In their, in their campaigning before actually the vote, they were, they were airing slogans that showed they were worried about election fraud. Dashi said, if there is fraud, Iran will revolt. And then after 2012, after the um, vote, they said in their slogans, we told you if there's going to be fraud, there will be revolt. That was actually one of their post-election slogans. So there's rioting June 13th. June 14th is really when you see the movement kind of take shape, much more organized, much more calm, especially because they got a lot of bad pre r The government really kind of focused on that rioting. Ahmadinejad came out and said, uh, these are a bunch of hasa khashak, sore losers, riffraff, street trash, sore losers. And so people got angry and then they came out and they were much more calm and collected. And a lot of these protests were silent marches, right? Um, and then June 15th is really when the uh, uprising um, crescendoed. Uh, it was this epic march in, in Tehran of all places. And it culminated um, at um, Freedom Square where a lot of the momentum of the Iranian revolution came to culminate uh, on uh, the all shooter protests of December 10th, 1978. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a, a slide from uh, in the next slide about this and, and, and so why it, it's a really good way of discussing my sources. Um, June 19th was when Khamenei gave a, uh, the Supreme leader of the country gave a rare Friday sermon. He doesn't typically give the Friday sermons unless there's a big issue at hand. And so he gave this issue, my father and I, uh, we're in California and we stayed up to like two or three o'clock in the morning to listen to it. And it was pretty intense. Um, he basically said, you know, in, in not so many words that, you know, this is a legitimate election. The Guardian Council has verified it, excuse me, has done its due diligence and has verified it. And now um, the imperialists are at the doors um, and that if the protests continue, it, it now constitutes a security threat to the country. And uh, we will have to implement a full-scale security crackdown. If any blood is shed, shed, it is on the hands of the opposition leaders, specifically Rah Musavi, Rahnavard, and Karoli. So the, uh, the crackdown, the, while there was like a, you know, crackdown before, it was a full-scale one on June 20th and onwards after his sermon. And on June 20th is when Neda Agha Sultan was killed. Neda Agha Sultan became the poster girl of the uprising, uh, especially because of her brutal death. All right, so book sources. Um, 
Abraham Yan, in his book on the coup, on the 1953 coup, uh, the CIA coup on against Dr. Mossadegh, um, he basically argues that even after 60 years, um, he can't get the government to respect its own 30-year rule, and he can't gain access to all those classified files. And this is a, you know, a world-renowned seasoned historian like Abraham Yan saying that in his book. But really what's interesting about 2009 is because a lot of it's digital. A lot of, it's, a lot of this footage is posted on YouTube. So if the Iranian revolution was the world's first televised revolution, the Green Uprising of 2009 was the world's first socially broadcast revolution. They were their own um, journalists. They were citizen journalists. They documented everything. They put it, they uploaded it, or they sent it abroad for people abroad or their uh, allies abroad to upload it onto YouTube. There's an entire archive. Um, and here's a really good case in point. This footage is from that June 15th epic march. Um, at the time, the mayor of Tehran acknowledged on state uh, on a state website, state-run website, that about three million Iranians had gathered in Tehran for this protest, and then that acknowledgement came down. Essentially, the Iranian government did not want to acknowledge the fact that three million people in one city had come out against it. So, you know, the mayor of Tehran acknowledged it, and then the website brought it down moments later. But that doesn't matter because they the activists themselves documented everything. So here's footage, it's about a minute long, we, we don't need to watch the whole thing, but here's footage of, of a civilian documenting with their own uh, camera. This is before the era of short uh, smart cameras, right? And smart cameras came around, came about uh, 2005, six and onwards, but they didn't really reach Iran by 2009. So this is a, a camera from a typical flip phone at the time. But you're going to see it. You're going to see that the Iranian government could, you know, did, didn't have control over the information anymore. Let me make sure that uh, audio is working. It is working. Okay. All right, so really the, the, the takeaway here is that the Iranian government tried to ignore the fact that this many people came out, but they documented it and then posted it online and kind of created their own digital archive for researchers like myself. So I was able to use a lot of archives, a lot of stuff about the 1970s, but when it came to 2009, I used a lot of stuff that was recorded um, including social media posts and, and interviews that I did with activists themselves and also activists penned pieces. They explained in their own words um, what they were doing, why they were airing certain slogans and what their objectives were, right? So when, I, when, I, when my whole approach was a bottom up approach, I also let them do the talking, right? So all the sources are Iran-based Persian language sources. They're not, um, you know, Persian language sources from the BBC or Voice of America or Radio Farda, these like, you know, State Department or British government funded sources. No, they are um, Persian language, Iran based sources, including state media port, uh, sources, because you, you have to contrast what the activists are saying, what, what the official government narrative is. Um, and really, that's what I did with the sources. Now, one thing that's really important, and we're really approaching the end, I promise. Um, one thing that's important is that when the crackdown happened, full-scale crackdown happened on June 20th after the Khamenei Friday sermon, the protests went from being every day to going underground and resurfacing on certain days, which is why the book is called Contesting the Iranian Revolution, The Green Uprisings, and not uprising, because it wasn't one continuous uprising it became scattered, many. It, it, it unfurled across Iran's political calendar, um, like Jerusalem Day, like Ashura, like the anniversary of the seizure of the US embassy, November 4th and December 7th. And so on these days, there a lot of them are really important to the Iranian revolutionary government because their dates important to the revolution themselves. These activists came out on those days to protest 
the government that came to power through the revolution. And they use slogans from the revolution themselves. So here, here's a um, footage about a minute long from a high school, an all girls high school. The, the slogans are in Persian. There are about six of them. They're all translated to the left, but I'm gonna play it for you anyways, even though it's in Persian, because you're gonna be able to sense the intensity of their slogans anyways. All right, so just to reiterate, they started using slogans from the revolution, like slogan two and four, on days important to revolutionary history to protest the outcome of the revolution, right? This is why this uprising was so fascinating. Oh, it's lost the screen. I'm gonna get it back. Okay, that happens from time to time. All right, concluding points. The Green Uprising is part of a genealogy of Iranian protests informed by the past and impacting the future. Islam can be, <clears throat> excuse me, Islam can be used to legitimate the state, but can simultaneously be used to provide a subversive discourse against that very Islamist state. The state does not have a monopoly on Islamic truth. And I gotta include this just because we're still kind of dealing with it, even though admit that the US administration has changed. Unilateral U.S. sanctions on Iran have shrunk the already small space for contentious politics. The scent is seen as part of a U.S. conspiracy in 2009 and now. Um, thank you. Please support the book. Um, more than anything, uh, please read it. And, um, you know, when you're done with it, don't just put it in your bookshelves. Let it collecting dust. Pass it on. Gift it to somebody. Um, encourage them to read it as well. Um, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for being with me. Thank you, Puya. That was uh, fascinating, and and I want to reiterate to our audience that it's uh, you know just skimming the surface of a very rich and insightful book. So I really do. Uh, I want you to buy the book and read it. Uh, now, we have a number of interesting questions. Uh, I want to go to the questions rather than lob mine in. Sorry, I've got a little problem. Let's see. There we go. Um, one of the questions uh, I thought was particularly interesting, um, and this comes from an anonymous attendee. At the time in Tehran in June 2009, the regime people claimed that they had learned from it and would restructure their apparatus to address such protests better. What do you think they learned from the 2009 events? And what did they do differently or not since then to pacify and control the potential for protest and uprising? Oof. All right, it's a good question. Um, I'll do what I can. Um, I think, well, I think one of the biggest lessons for the Iranian government is that I think they were in denial about the level of anger that a lot of people had for the government. So that was the first lesson learned was that there, there are literally millions of people who are very unhappy with the political climate in the country. That's for certain. Um, 
But I think that we kind of see this in the uprising that the security personnel had become militarized, right? Um, they look like, kind of like in the United States, like when we now see police, oftentimes we're surprised they look like combat brigades, right? Uh, Iran in 2009 already looked like that. Uh, a lot of the security, a lot of the police were very militarized and um, they succeeded actually in, in driving the protest movement underground. Um, so I think, I think really the question is what did the opposition learn from 2009? Because the, the Iranian government learned that even if millions rise up, it can endure a storm. Like think about it, this is 2009. Two years later with the Arab Spring, um, countries like in Egypt and Yemen and you know in uh, Libya, a lot of those countries imploded because of the massive uprising. The Iranian government not only withstood all that, but then it helped um, sustain one of those Arab Spring countries like Egypt, uh, like Syria. So really, in a way, it, it taught the Iranian government that there is widespread animosity towards it but also that it has, a, it has the number of the opposition because it, it was able to you know, muster so much support for itself. Like when we saw this, this was evidenced in the Bisudo Bahman protest, the, the, the Revolution Day pro-government protest where literally the government was able to bring out millions of its own supporters. And that's, that's really when the movement kind of began to taper off the green movement because they were stunned by the level of support the government had. So the government was able to muster that support, but it also was very effective in, the mul in deploying the multiple layers of security against the uprising. That's one of the things that the Shah never had. The Shah had a secret police, and then it had a military. And then when the uprising, when the revolution unfolded, it, pit, it basically um, deployed the military, a conscript army against uh, the revolutionaries. And a lot of them ended up taking off their you know, um, jackets and their um, belts and joining the revolution because they were conscripts. They were trained to defend the territorial integrity of the country, not shoot protesters, many of whom were their family members or their neighbors, right? So that's why the Iranian revolution, one of the reasons why it happened was because the Shah's military began to unravel. The Iranian government didn't have, the Iranian government in 2009 didn't have that problem because it didn't deploy the national army against the green uprising. It had developed multiple layers of security and it deployed those against the uprising. And we only see one or two instances of security personnel taking off their helmet and their jackets and joining with the uprising. I think the lesson that was learned from the opposition um, was that while we may have failed to unseat Ahmadinejad or the system that ratified him, we have stripped by and large the Iranian government of a lot of its sources of legitimacy. And so militarily, the Iranian government is still very much intact, maybe even more intact now than 2009. But in terms of legitimacy, in terms of being able to harness those symbols that it has been cultivating for decades to legitimate itself, a lot of those have been robbed by the green movement. That's one of the successes that I really go in detail um, in the book. I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> you know, we do what we Let can. Let me follow up with something um, based on what you just said. It, it strikes me that one of the problems of uprisings, wherever they are, uh, some of them on Capitol Hill here and uh, all over the world really, is that without institutions that support an uprising, without, a, without platforms that are either labor unions or the news media or educational institutions or other kinds of, it's not necessarily government, um, it's very hard to succeed. And I wonder if that was one of the, um, one of the absences, so to speak, of the green movement in, 2009 and subsequently? Yeah, so I would say that's one of the absences with the Green Movement and with the Arab Spring, right? There is, um, I don't want to totalize, but you know, and I don't want to pass this off as my own knowledge. This is something that Asif Bayat has really talked about in one of his latter books called Revolution Without Revolutionaries by Stanford University Press. He basically argues that, you know, neoliberalism 
has not only shaped the state and the economy, but has shaped the way through which the opposition expresses its opposition, right? So one of the things that kind of went in favor of the green movement also went against it. In favor how? Because it didn't really have an ideology, right? Um, it was, it became this like canopy of resistance against the state. Anyone who had a problem with the Iranian government basically came underneath it. But they didn't have the, a real blueprint or or, uh, or even somebody that wanted revolution. Like Mir Hussein Musavi did not want a revolution. Whereas in 1978-79, uh, Khomeini was resolute about revolution and was resolute about what he wanted. He wanted an Islamic government and he had laid it down in a book called Hukumat Islami, Islamic government. And then he built institutions even before he took power. Like he established the Revolutionary Council um, before the Shah's military had fully collapsed on February 11th, right? Um, and they had an ideology. Ideology is really important, right? And this is kind of the issue with the 20th century. There was ideology and the opposition was able to manifest its opposition in ideological terms so that if it won, then the preceding state by default would have to be destroyed. A lot of the problems with the uprisings today is that they focus on the figurehead like Hosni Mubarak, Muammar Gaddafi, you know, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, without addressing the system that has given rise to these types of people and these, and these situations, right? They don't provide an alternative blueprint. They talk about human rights, civil rights, individual rights, women's rights, but how is that connected to power and the economy and the structure? None of the uprisings that I've seen at least, I may be wrong, really kind of address these issues. And, and how is it uh, manifesting today? I mean, we have, a, we have an election coming up in Iran uh, in June or spring in any case. Um, Rouhani uh, has been, you know, pilloried by the right, by the conservatives, mm -hmm. because in part because of the the nuclear deal with the United yeah. States and the other European and Russia and China. Um, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic has really ravaged Iran. So there's a lot of weakness at the center if you consider Rouhani sort of at the center a technocrat mm -hmm. uh, who has the support of a lot of reformists. Where where is it going from here, and where does the green uprising? Where do the where do the greens manifest themselves in this upcoming election process, or is the election not really important? Are they doing other things to influence uh, the future course of Iran? Okay, there's a lot of good, a lot of layers to that question. Um, I, I before I try to answer, I just want to echo what you just said that the Trump administration pulling out of the JCPOA, an agreement that was holding and was working, has very much undermined um, and polarized the politics in the, in, inside Iran. The pandemic has accentuated everything in every country. So if there was problems, those problems have been magnified everywhere. I would also add that the Trump administration has tightened sanctions on Iran during the pandemic, which is something that we just it just has to be said because it's so terrible, that it's such a terrible and failed policy. Having said that, I'll say that, you know, when we talk about the green movement or the green uprisings, we have to just understand we're not talking about this thing that's steady and constant. It has been evolving and manifesting in different ways. So we know that when the green, when, um, when the Iran nuclear agreement was first signed, people by then, you know, Ahmadinejad was gone. You know, the green movement issues had kind of faded. There was a new president, but they came out and said, uh, It is great, it is grand, it is grand. Uh, the absence of neda is at hand. So you kind of see those, those issues kind of still manifesting and simmering to the top, right? Uh, neda being the one who died uh, on June 20th in 2009. Or when, um, or when, when uh, Raf Sanjani passed away, Raf Sanjani was sympathetic toward the green movement. During his funeral, you see a lot of green movement slogans, right? About Mir Hussein Musavi and, and, 
and stuff like that because he's still under house arrest. Or when um, the uprisings that happened in 2017, 2018, and 2019, you don't see or hear anything about the Green Movement, but you see slogans that the Green Movement innovated being aired again. Like, um, uh, what's the one? Na Gaza, na Lebanon, John and Fadaya Iran. No to Gaza, no to Lebanon. My life is only for Iran. That was a slogan that was aired in the Jerusalem Day protests on September 18th, 2009. So 11 years ago, you still hear those slogans. And that's really not like this anti Arab or anti Palestinian sentiment, although there's probably shades of that. I go through it in chapter four of the book. But really, the Iranian government legitimates itself by saying that it champions the liberation of Palestine. And here they are negating that source of legitimacy really to snub the Iranian government. So like, I don't, I don't, I don't anticipate seeing people wearing green anytime soon, right? But a lot of the legacy informs the trajectory that Iran is now on, right? So uh, it, when, when Rouhani was up for re-election, um, they, it was again a time that they used another campaign color. It was like purple. And they really said purple, green, we're all the same, right? So they, they're really like through color connecting these campaigns or these movements or these grievances really. So um, I think by now after this long-winded answer, I may have forgotten your original question. <laughs> <laughs> I know how it was being manifested. You're, you're answering it for sure. Okay. And, yeah. um, What's going know, to happen? Election, with, I think is going to be, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how it, how it does manifest in, in the election cycle that, that's upcoming. Yeah, I do I want to I, get back to the questions of our sure. Uh, sure, okay. audience. One of them particularly mischievous, I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, how would you, and it's relevant to what we we're just discussing, how would you depict uh, the green uprisings in Iran compared with the insurrection January 6 on Capitol Hill? And one oh. thing you just said while you're thinking about it actually reminded me of it, and that is, um, you know, the America first element to this, get out of forever wars, come home, uh, take care of your own people. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> that is a pretty mischievous question, uh, but I like it, I like it, good, keep on my feet. I'll kind of, if I may, add, to, add a layer to the question. When um, the insurrection in DC was actually happening, I had a Zoom call uh, with somebody and you know, I was asking, him, we were asking about each other how our day was going and he said something like, you know, I'm just, I'm stunned about what I'm seeing on TV because it reminds me of scenes from Tehran. And, you know, I thought about it. And, and later I was like, that's just, they're just not the same. Protesting, it, it, I know the question was about 2009, but protesting and seizing the US embassy in Tehran in 1978 was an, a very much an anti-imperialist act, not to condone it, but Mark Bowden said this was Iran's version of the Boston Tea Party, right? They were seizing the U.S. embassy, the same U.S. embassy that had overthrown the Iranian government in 1953. The United States, through the U.S. embassy, had overthrown Mossad. Comparing things that happened in Iran, oftentimes that are anti-imperialist, was happening in the capital of this global force are just very different, right? I would say that what happens in Iran is kind of like an anti-imperialist event on the periphery of empire, Whereas what happens with the insurrection is kind of like infighting in the headquarters of the global power. And, you know, when I say global power, that's really a euphemism for something else. How does the green uprising now compare to the January 6th insurrection? Uh, I think it's very different. Um, I don't think, I think that the, 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 the insurrection in, in, in January 6th was fueled by a head of state that was um, basing everything on a bed of lies. Whereas the protesters in 2009, uh, very peaceful, by the way, uh, very peaceful, and who were on the receiving end of violence, 
and who were not basing their actions on fake news, a conspiracy, or you know, the dark web. I think it's a huge difference. Indeed. Um, I, I want to thank Puya. We're, we're just out of time, and I want to apologize to our audience for not getting to all your questions, although um, I think he answered quite a few of them along the way. Uh, please do get this wonderful, uh, deeply informed book, Contesting the Iranian Revolution, the Green Uprisings, um, from Cambridge University Press. And thank you, Puya, uh, for uh, coming on with us today. And thank you. It was, it was the my audience. pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And our, thank you. Thank you to the whole team. Thank you. A nice large audience. So see you next time. Uh, be well and um, keep the faith. Bye bye.